spec rate, it seems that the uh, Rocket Machine data should drive bias compared to the bias or later sound like this. But from this, only from this figure, we cannot decide because we are not sure which is true. But comparing to the previous world paper obtained by GNS, we can confirm this show the difference between uh, of the previous world paper between later sound and the GNS derived world paper or rocket matching uh, later sound and vice versa later sound. You can see uh, it show the only the rocket matching show the dry bias compared to the GNS derived world paper. So based on this figure. We decided the uh, bicep seems to be good uh, compared to uh, the GS derived water paper. Okay. Then uh, I will not talk about much, but uh, uh, we can adjust the uh, rocket matching data to the uh, uh, bicella uh, using a cumulative distribution function matching method. A anyway, we can obtain the uh, correction value for rocket matching data. Uh, which adjust to the by cellular later sound using uh, we made a lookup table like this one. So applying this uh, collection value, of course we obtain the uh, uh, correct value uh, or at least a similar uh, similar between the rocket matching and the uh, by Sarah. But uh, we wonder that can this correction method can apply to the BSM twenty twenty at Yap or Palo. Something that's like okay, our time is coming. Okay, so all we obtained only the latest on the data, but uh, how we can confirm they have a dry bias or not? So to confirm this uh, possibility, we assume that, the, for example, we assume the specific humidity average in the boundary layer should be close to that observed the surface. Barrier. Uh, if you are familiar with latest on sounding, may, you, may, you may know that sounding, latest on sounding data as the initial point is obtained by not latest sound but soft meteorological stations. So it means that uh, they have uh, contained the two data set. So using those data, we can compare on them. Uh, we can judge if they have a dry bias or not. Okay. And uh, during the intensive uh, in contact comparison, we can confirm the uh, our collection scheme adjust to this very well. And uh, but uh, fortunately, we must be aware because such inter comparison conducted only very dry condition or very fine uh, clear day. So such a collection should be applied only in the daytime and the fine day. Okay. So uh, during the twenty eighteen campaign. We obtained two months period uh, sounding data. We applied the correction scheme to only to clear a uh, fine daytime data set. Uh, the result is, is here. You can see uh, correct value is very close to the uh, each other. The surface value and uh, boundary layer mean value like this. So uh, similar uh, comparison is made for another site obtained at the YAP or Palau in 2020. As you can see, the, uh, uh, they also show the, some uh, biases only during the uh, clear fine day, daytime sounding, like this one. Because during the nighttime or during the uh, rainy days, we could not see uh, uh, they are almost, uh, uh, they, they did not show any significant difference like this, but only daytime sounding showed a clear difference compared to others. So we decided to apply the same procedure like this one. You can see from now we obtain the correct value. So uh, since uh, we intend to, oh, I'm sorry, this is not a correct time period, but uh, just for the 2020. Okay, yeah, this period. I'm oh yeah, oh yeah, sorry. Anyway, we obtained the collective value for sounding data at YAP and the parallel. I didn't show, I will not show the parallel case, but all the same figures. So, based on the using uh, technique developed for the 2018 uh, under the field campaign in Philippines, we apply the same collection procedure to, uh, to the data obtained in 2020. Uh -oh. Okay, oh, time is coming. Yes. So, finally, I would like to also mention that 
uh, we organize the cross organization speech correction. And uh, so far, the many journals join this camp, uh, this uh, correct special correction. For example, if you access to JGR special correction pages, they have a link to the uh, YMC cross organization special correction pages. And uh, it means that uh, it is not necessary to check many, uh, to look for the many paper, uh, YMC papers at different pages. If you access to our website, you can find almost all YMC related papers. Uh, in, indeed, so far, we started this special correction since January 2020. Uh, so far, uh, 120 papers have already been published as a YMC, uh, this special uh, cross organization special correction papers. So if you access to this site, you can see uh, at once like this one. If you access to our site or, but uh, as I mentioned that uh, currently our site is not available. So if you access to the YMC, uh, BMKG web website, you can easily see all le uh, YMC relevant papers like this one. Okay, so today, uh, I'm sorry due to the, uh, the uh, my uh, bad time management, so I cannot speak much in detail, but uh, today I show the some uh, status of the uh, field campaign, and uh, and also the uh, I strongly request uh, recommend you if you obtain a new results and uh, if you want to publish papers, uh, please consider to submit to the cross organization special correction. And uh, oh, this is my thread because this. Currently, uh, our data site, as I mentioned, that, uh, some data set is already being available, but since our site is not available, you cannot obtain the data through our website. However, some data, uh, data uh, field campaign already opened their data from their own uh, data site. I will, uh, maybe later I will share this slide so you can check and uh, if you want to obtain, you want to use the, some data set obtained as a part of the YMC or a collaborative project, uh, you can get the uh, data through this site. That's all. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Kunio. Uh, it's a very comprehensive talk. So uh, uh, due to the time limit, uh, we can open one quick question. Uh, if you can please come forward to the blue broadcaster symbol. Anyone? So, uh, Kunio, I, I think uh, yeah. we, we are um, excited to see uh, your 2020 experiments uh, due to the limitation of the pandemics. So uh, I, I think uh, we would like to talk to you later about your uh, uh, quality control, the intercomparison between different soundings, because we, we are mm -hmm. also doing some domestic uh, field experiments that, mm -hmm. that we, we are also comparing our kind of in-house developed mini radio sound with the Vaisala. Uh -huh. so, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I think it would be very uh, interesting to, okay. to learn from each other. I Okay, yeah, I also uh, interested in the interacting with uh, talk, talk, uh, discussion about that issue. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I think we have to move on. So uh, let me share. Okay, so we will proceed to our second talk uh, by Professor Eric Maloney from Colorado State University. So Eric is the leading scientist for the U.S. Piston field campaigns uh, conducted over the American continent, uh, Western Pacific area. And he is also doing um, many important researches about the MJO and the American continent climate variability. So today we're happy to have him talk about the MJO maritime continent interactions, current and future climate. So Eric, please come up uh, to the stage. Okay. Hi. Can you yes. yes, we can hear you. Please share. Okay. Screen. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Good. Now we see your. Uh, yeah. Yes. Very good. So please start, Eric. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Professor Chen and Professor Sway as well. Um, I you know, very much wish that I can be there in person, but hopefully um, we'll all get together in a year or two to exchange ideas. Um, I look forward to that day. 
So I'm going to talk here about um, some of our current research on the Madden-Julian Oscillation and Maritime Continent interactions. And I have a lot of sponsors that are um, responsible for this research and also a lot of co-authors responsible for this research as well. So certainly as I go along here, I won't be able to take credit for all of the work that I'm going to present here. Okay, so first of all, an outline of what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna first talk about this recent paper that was led by Adam Sobel related to the Piston Field Program. And in particular, we talked about the 2018 leg of Piston, and I'll talk about some key results from this from an atmospheric standpoint. Next, what I'm gonna talk about is some work that I've been doing with one of my graduate students, Mike Natoli, here at Colorado State University, looking at how intraseasonal variability interacts with the diurnal cycle during boreal summer. And we're in particular gonna concentrate on the Philippines. So that'll be the second part of my talk. And then the last part of my talk um, is actually something that we're working on with one of our students, uh, Wei Ting Shou, who actually comes from NTU. And we're going to discuss um, the role of maritime continent precipitation biases in producing extratropical forecast errors across the United States. And so this will be the last um, thing that I will discuss. Okay, so first of all, um, I'm going to talk about the 2018 leg of the Piston Field Campaign. Um, so first of all, I want to note is that Piston did extend over two summers. Uh, there was a 2019 phase where Piston did some joint observations with Campex. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to concentrate on 2018. Um, and I should also note that the discussion here is going to be mainly from an atmospheric perspective. So there was a lot of interesting oceanography that went on in 2018 associated with typhoon passage and the effect of the upper ocean that I won't talk about. Um, so this is going to be mainly concentrating on the atmosphere. Um, and, and, and given that, I'm not going to talk about all of the atmospheric measurements either. Um, there was, for example, one period where the Thompson here was doing dual Doppler measurements with the Marai during Piston. And there's a lot of interesting results that come out of that as well um, that I won't talk about, but people like Steve Rutledge um, at CSU um, are, are involved with. Um, so Piston, just as a reminder, stands for Propagation of Tropical Intraseasonal Oscillations. And so we were hoping when we were out here to see the BSISO, while we were out in the field. Um, in reality, as I'll show you in the next slide, there wasn't too much intraseasonal variability associated with the BSISO, but there was a lot of variability on shorter time scales. So this is a Hovmiller of the um, OLR in total form on the left and an anomaly form on the right in the region of the piston field observations um, that are shown in these black lines here. And the black lines essentially represent where the ship was located, at least the longitude that the ship was located out um, during the piston campaign. Um, on the right are the OLR anomalies. And one thing that I wanna point out is that there wasn't very strong intraseasonal variability associated with the BSISO or MJO during this 2018 period. Um, if you look at it, there was possibly a suppressed phase of the BSISO that occurred in October. But much of the rest of the time here, you can see that there are um, relatively strong westward propagating disturbances. And so much of the time was dominated by tropical depression type disturbances and also variability on 10 to 25 day timescales or quasi biweekly timescales associated with something called the QBWO. So that tended to dominate and only during the later period was there really strong intraseasonal variability. Um, another thing that we saw a lot of was typhoon activity um, during this period. So the piston observation box was centered down here, just in the north of Palau. And you can see the multitude of typhoons that occurred um, during the observation period. Um, this actually presented an opportunity, as I mentioned before, for ocean measurements in that 
we were able to sample, um, you know, pre and, and post typhoon, um, you know, measurements of the upper ocean, um, you know, during this period, in particular, um, in association with uh, typhoon Mankut. Um, but, um, you know, th this also, you know, as I mentioned, presented an opportunity um, for, for the field's, um, you know, campaign. So one really interesting thing that we saw out in the field um, quite a bit were these um, strong monsoon extensions that were associated with typhoon periods. Um, researchers in the Philippines had noted this before, um, and these were associated with you know, documented flooding events in the Philippines. But this is one example of one of these events that we saw out in the field associated with Typhoon Jebi. Um, and so this first panel here is September 1st, 2018, showing the typhoon here, centered at about 20 degrees north, and lower tropospheric winds starting to develop very strong from the west on the south side of this typhoon. Um, and you can see the satellite image here. Um, and then what's really interesting is the typhoon moved off towards the north, this area of very strong west winds actually strengthened and actually um, maintained itself for multiple days, even in the absence of um, the typhoon, you know, once it left the region. And so we found this phenomenon very, very interesting. And this, you know, extended, you know, monsoon west wind pattern actually lasted for multiple days, you know, even on the order of a week after the typhoon left. Um, we had this vision in our heads before the um, field program that the basic state um, is what actually caused the typhoons to form. Um, but in this case, it actually looks like the typhoon is actually modulating the basic state instead. So the direction of interaction of uh, you know, monsoonal flow and typhoons um, seems to be possibly two-way based on what we saw in the field. This is only one example. We also saw other examples of this as well um, out in the field during Piston. Um, these strong wind periods, as I mentioned, um, lasted multiple days. And so this bottom panel here shows zonal wind anomalies um, from sounding observations from the RV Thompson when we were out in the field during Piston. Typhoon Jebi occurred during this first period here at the beginning of September. And you can see that these very strong west winds associated with Typhoon Jebi um, lasted for about a week. Um, you see similar phenomena associated with Typhoon Trami here and also um, Kong Ray. So multiple times during the field program, we saw the initiation of these very strong monsoon westerlies that seemed to be preceded by um, a typhoon passing through the area, which was very, very interesting to us. Um, so we have a lot of questions about what actually maintains this long lived um, you know, monsoon westerly period initiated by the typhoons. Um, we have some ideas. Um, these are some surface observations during the piston field campaign. And you can see um, two, you know, particularly, really, particularly strong wind periods here. The first associated during September, early September, with um, Typhoon Jebi that I talked about before, associated with very strong winds and very strong heat fluxes out of the ocean. Um, then there was another period here um, towards October um, associated with Kong Ray that was also associated with very strong fluxes and sustained periods of very strong winds, um, you know, fluxing um, water vapor out of the ocean. So the observations during Piston have actually led us to um, some research questions that we want to follow up on in subsequent work, whether it being extended observations or modeling. And one is, you know, something I alluded to before, um, what comes first, these uh, monsoon wind events or the typhoons? And, you know, in many cases, you know, it, it seems like the typhoons help to initiate, you know, these monsoonal extensions, uh, which is, you know, something we didn't really expect, um, you know, before going out to the field. Maybe others have looked at this, you know, people from the Philippines have thought about this a lot, but surprised us um, when we were out on the Thompson. Um, how are these monsoon extensions or tails maintained over multiple days? Um, possibly surface fluxes and wind-induced surface fluxes help to maintain these extensions. 
And there's also this, you know, quasi biweekly variability, 10 to 25 day variability I mentioned before. And we also have questions about how these monsoon extensions are actually related to these 10 to 25 five day oscillations in, in this region, since it, that seems to be a very, seem to be a very dominant time scale during the piston fuel campaign. So I'm actually collaborating with Sue Vandenheever and Bowen Pan um, here at CSU to follow up on, on some of these issues. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the diurnal cycle. And one paper that I want to talk about very briefly first is some work that we, do, we, that we did on the BSISO and the diurnal cycle with one of my graduate students, Mike Natoli. This is a composite life cycle of the BSISO based on the Lee et al. index. And you can see the formation of precipitation centers here near the equator that then move northward in time over places like the Philippines. So for example, at phase seven, you see enhanced convection over the entire uh, South China Sea and Philippine Sea here associated with the BSISO. So Mike looked at how the phase uh, and the amplitude of the diurnal cycle vary as a function of BSISO phase. And these plots here show longitude on the x-axis. I'm sorry, I don't have longitude here and time on the y-axis, and this is a cross-section, basically across Luzon Island in the Philippines. So th those are the longitudes we're interested in here. Um, so one interesting thing that other people have seen for the MJO in the maritime continent during boreal winter is that it's the transition phases in this region where you actually see the strongest diurnal cycle. So phase five and phase six, for example, you see a very strong uh, diurnal cycle initiated over land, that then propagates westward over the South China Sea with time. Um, other phases, like phases one and two, not as much. And then when the BSISO convective um, anomaly comes over, um, over the ocean, phases seven and eight, you also don't see a very strong diurnal cycle. It's mainly these transition phases, phases five and six. So this min does mimic what people see near Sumatra Island um, and other equatorial islands of the maritime continent during MJO passes during boreal winter, for example. Um, another thing that we wanted to look at, though, is, you know, whether or not other phenomena like the 10 to 20 day or quasi biweekly oscillation cause a similar modulation of the diurnal cycle in this region. So Mike looked at this in a paper we just submitted to Journal of Atmospheric Sciences in 2021. And he came up with an index for the quasi uh, biweekly oscillation um, using an extended EOF analysis. And he did composites and these composites here are for every other phase of the QBWO, starting with phase one here and going to phase seven. So colors on here are convection. And you can see that there is a general northward propagation of convection and west winds that occurs in the QBWO that starts near the equator and then moves northward. Um, but importantly for this um, talk is that very similar to the BSISO, you see alternating periods of convection and west or east wind anomalies associated with the QBWO over the Philippines. And we wanted to look at whether or not this modulates the diurnal cycle. And the answer is yes, it looks very, very similar to what we see for the BSISO. So we've modified the phases to you know, be comparable to the BSISO phases we saw before. And you know, very similarly, you know, during these transition periods between suppressed convection and enhanced convection, like phases four, five, and six here, <clears throat> you see um, uh, increase in diurnal cycle amplitude that propagates offshore of the Philippines. So it seems like regardless of what phenomenon we're looking at, um, you know, over the Philippines, whether it be the BSISO or Q QBWO, it produces a similar modulation of the diurnal cycle. And the conditions that actually um, are associated with um, the strongest offshore propagation of the diurnal cycle in these regions are actually common between the BSISO and QBWO. And those include an atmosphere, an atmosphere that is sufficiently moist. And so to propagate offshore, um, you need a 
you know, moisture content in the um, atmosphere that's high enough to support convection in the presence of entrainment. Um, you need um, moderate amounts of insulation over land. So you need some um, appreciable diurnal cycle and insulation over land in order to um, you know, create a diurnal cycle. And then um, we, we find that um, daily mean flow that is weak or um, offshore you know, towards the west tends to produce a very strong diurnal cycle um, offshore of the Philippines. Um, this is for boreal summer. Um, again, you know, many people may note that some of these conditions have also been proposed for boreal winter, um, you know, modulation of the diurnal cycle um, associated with the MJO, but they also seem to be relevant here uh, near the Philippines. So one thing that we've been doing lately, and I can't tell you too much about this, is that we've been doing some um, high resolution modeling experiments using cloud model one, where we've been looking at the sensitivity of offshore propagation to wind direction, um, moisture contents, um, insulation, and a variety of other factors. And we've been finding sensitivities that are actually very consistent with some of our hypotheses based on observations. And so this actually shows a result of 2D simulations with cloud model one with an idealized 200 kilometer wide island in the middle denoted by these dashed lines. And what we're doing here is we're keeping moisture, insulation, and a whole bunch of other factors constant, but we're varying the wind speed to mimic, um, wind, wind direction um, and speed to mimic what it looks like um, as a function of BSISO phase. And so we're going from phase one to phase eight here. And we find that, you know, when we only modulate um, the, you know, daily mean wind, we can actually reproduce many of the characteristics of the diurnal cycle that we see with observation. So for example, phases three, four, and five here are characterized by a very strong diurnal cycle um, that propagates offshore towards the west from this idealized island. Um, so suggests that, you know, at least if you look at wind alone, it can explain many of the characteristics of the diurnal cycle that we see near the Philippines. Um, a lot of other results on these modeling experiments that I could present at another time, but they're, you know, providing some very intriguing clues as to, you know, what reg regulates Philippines offshore propagation. Okay, so the last thing that I will finish up with here is how the maritime continent and model biases in this region affect extratropical precipitation errors. And so I mentioned that this is um, something that we're doing with Elizabeth Barnes and I with one of our students, Wei Ting. So you can see Wei Ting here. Wei Ting is actually going to defend his master's thesis next week before continuing on with me for PhD work. So we're very excited about that. So what we're doing in these um, experiments um, are using the NOAA Unified Forecasting System. And we have two sets of runs that we're analyzing. One set of runs is we're analyzing free hindcast from 1999 to 2018. So after initialization, everything is allowed to evolve freely. And then the other thing that we're looking at are hindcasts with the tropics nudged to reanalysis. And so we're basically nudging the tropics to maintain realistic MJO variability, Kelvin wave variability, all sorts of other equatorial modes. And the thing we wanna look at is how does precipitation um, forecast bias along the west coast of the United States um, differ if we constrain the tropics to look perfect? as far as this MJO simulation and other, other tropical waves. And the key here is we're looking at the effect of tropical nudging on U.S. West Coast precipitation forecast three to four weeks out in advance. So generally, um, when we nudge the tropics, forecasts along the U.S. West Coast get better. So the red line is to the left of the blue line. So mean forecast there gets better in this West Coast precipitation box when we nudge. But we've also been finding some other really interesting things. Um, there are initial states in the tropics that actually show the greatest forecast improvement. 
And the state um, using defined using cluster analysis that produces the greatest improvement is shown on the top here. And it's basically associated with a period when you have precipitation anomalies uh, developing in the Indian Ocean, suppressed convection over the maritime continent, and then enhanced precipitation near the dateline. Um, this projects very strongly onto MJO phases one, two, and eight. So it's you know, associated with early MJO phases. And it's also um, tends to be associated with ENSO phases that are not uh, cold, so either neutral or warm. Um, so this is the phase that actually produces the greatest forecast improvements um, when you nudge. And basically, um, you know, what's going on here, and look at this last row, um, the observations are on the right. It's called replay, but it's basically observations. And you can see um, at the initial time, there's a strong elution low, and that elution low dies off. When you constrain the tropics uh, by nudging, the same thing basically happens. But if you look at the free hindcast without nudging, the elution low doesn't weaken quite as much. So basically, the forecasts associated with this state or this cluster is improved because of what's going on with teleconnections to the elution low. And we looked a little bit more at this, and essentially what is going on is that in the free run, the free run cannot maintain an MJO that crosses the maritime continent. But if you provide nudging to the tropics, you can actually um, sustain an MJO that propagates across the maritime continent, and that actually weakens the initial strong negative precipitation anomaly that occurred in the initial state. So you can see that, you know, nudging has a lot less precipitation than free here. Um, so um, the model has problems, you know, crossing the maritime continent and we could help it out with nudging to actually improve the simulation and improve uh, West Coast precipitation. Um, just to wrap up here, um, I know that I promised in my talk title that I would talk about future climate as well. I don't have time to do that, but I just wanted to mention that Wei Ting, our student, has actually published two papers during his master's degree. And so one of the papers that he looked at was actually looking at MJO climate changes over the 21st century. And you know that's a paper I can present to people uh, at another time. Okay, so just to wrap up here, um, I talked about some piston results and showed that um, you know strong biweekly variability occurred during piston and the interaction between tropical cyclones and the monsoon flow seems to be an important player in this you know biweekly variability that we saw during piston. So there's a lot of unanswered questions that we still want to look at. Um, we looked at the downhill cycle and um, both the BSISO and QBWO similarly affected Philippines diurnal cycle and um, the wind direction and insulation uh, appear to be very strong determinants and, and moisture in, of propagation into the South China Sea during, during certain phases. Um, and then I showed um, some results from the NOAA UFS model showing that biases in the maritime continent region associated with the MJO, substantially degrade U.S. West Coast precipitation forecasts. And um, these can be corrected with tropical nudging, but ideally um, these results might provide some guidance for model, developer, model developers to help um, um, improve convective parameterizations to better simulate MJO propagation across the maritime continent. So um, with that, I want to say thank you. And um, you know, thank you again for the invitation. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, very in-depth uh, talk. So uh, let's open the floor for a question. Please come up uh, to the front. Anyone? Uh, I will start with the first one. Oh, I see Minghui. Minghui, go ahead. Yes. Oh, hi, Eric. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Okay, hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. And uh, I uh, have one quick question for your last part about uh, tropical nudges. So, uh, will different region of tropical nudges affect the result you show here? For example, right now, maybe we, we focus on, I mean, waiting folks on the, uh, from India Ocean to maybe Maritime or Western Pacific. 
So I'm just curious whether there will be a hot spot for this Najin area mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and that's something that we didn't look at. So our nudging um, is, um, you know, 100 um, percent between 15 north and 15 south. And then it tapers off to 30 degrees. So it has a Gaussian um, you know, form. Uh, but we have other other experience experiments that we haven't looked at yet that limit um, the, the region of nudging um, closer to the equator. We haven't um, thought about um, limiting the, the region of nudging in longitude, but that seems like something very useful to do. We, we've been doing these nudging experiments in collaboration with George Colatis and Juliana Diaz at, at NOAA in, in Boulder. And, um, um, you know, this is a, still an ongoing collaboration. And so I think you know, that idea would actually be very useful to explore with them to see if we can find a nudging to the maritime continent and if it, if it retains the same result or, or, or it produces something different. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Minghui. Uh, anyone with questions? So uh, I'm curious about the typhoon case you mentioned in the Western Pacific. So you mentioned that uh, uh, we're, we're still maybe uh, trying to figure out whether the, the West release comes before the typhoon develops. Can you comment more on, on that part? Yeah. yeah, so I had a paper that I wrote in 2003 with uh, Michael Dickinson where um, we had assumed that, for example, the BSISO comes along, you know, modulates the flow, and then eddies grow on the flow variations associated with the monsoon, um, you know, tropical depression type disturbances that then become tropical cyclones. So coming into the field program, that's the vision I had in my head, but then after, um, you know, looking at this region, I mean, people probably in, in the, you know, in the Western Pacific already knew this, <laughs> but you know, my, you know, naive, um, you know, view coming in um, to the you know, Western Pacific um, was surprised that we saw these typhoons um, in three or four cases actually preceding the development of these um, westerly, uh, very strong westerly monsoon bands. And so, um, you know, because of that, um, I'm collaborating with uh, Sue Vandenhever and, and one of her students, Bo and Pan. And what we're going to do is we're um, going to try to come up with a, a database or, or an index for um, the strength of the monsoon trough and relate it to um, you know tropical cyclones and, and, and see you know what the interaction is um, you know what the what the lead lag relationship is and, and then think about the dynamics based on the relationships that we see. So um, I, it it got me very excited actually. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think for the time being, we have to move on. And thank you, Eric, very much for the nice talk. Thank you. So uh, our uh, last but not the least uh, keynote uh, will be provided by uh, Professor Sui Zhongxing from NTU. And Professor Sui is the uh, PI of the uh, Systems Field um, Project. and. Uh, Actually, a lot of the South China Sea-related uh, uh, research has been uh, under this uh, uh, big uh, integrated projects. So today, uh, Professor Sui will talk about the current systems progress and the related S2S research. So, uh, Professor Sui, please share your screen. Please turn on your microphone. Okay, can you see me? Now? Yes, we see you and we can hear you. So okay, you can me, uh, share your screen. Let me uh, display my PPT file. Okay.
page is open. I don't know how to change to the display mode. Uh, do you see your PowerPoint? Uh, yes, window? I'm, I'm at pressing out, out LT and the tab. Uh -huh, and then, and then I, how do I choose? Use my mouse? No, no, no. You, you use the tab. Uh, uh -huh. It will move uh, to different windows. You, you press tab uh, uh, one more time. Okay, let me try again. Uh, sorry, we have to wait a few minutes. Uh, I will try to reach Professor Sui. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I think we have some technical uh, problems. So uh, let me suggest we have a five minute break and let's come back in uh, five minutes. Okay, I'll try to save Professor Say for his presentation. <laughs> sorry about that. Screen share. Screen share. Okay. Okay. Now, 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 而且不让我分享我现在整个荧幕画面嘛对吧我分享但他不去不理我不让我分享
，那现在有右下角有分享跟取消，但是分享我按他就不理我。好、oh, oh, oh. ，OK OK， 现在可以分享了。OK 吗？好，好，那老师在呃，老师可以点一下这上面的这个那个画面的场景。你说什么？下面。对对对，按一下，按一下，最右边最右边，隐藏两个字，好，隐藏 ，OK， 好， BPT 单 ，OK， 开了，片。OK， 那我们现在就看到完整的画面。那我现在把 Skype 挂掉了。好，谢谢。OK， can everybody see my slides? Yes. OK, sorry for this <laughs>、uh, problem. So I let's let's start the the talk. So I'm going to talk about the, the current Systemax progress and the related S2S research. So、uh, the Systemax、uh, stands for the South China Sea Two Island Monsoon Experiment,、uh, which is one of the field campaigns of the YMC and the integrated uh, project uh, that the interaction of convection of the Maritime continent, South China Sea, with large-scale flow. This is the first、uh, project supported by most. And then, currently, I'm performing this, the follow-up project. It's also an integrated project titled "Research and the Prediction of Subseasonal to Seasonal Oscillations in Tropical Indo-Pacific Warm Pool Region." And、uh, So I'm just trying to briefly go over the scientific、uh, objectives that stem from uh, uh, Systemax all the way to current projects. So basically, we、uh, consider three uh, components uh, for this、uh, Systemax research. The first one is、uh, the, the observations. And the system is the, the major field campaign, and then we have another component cover the large scale dynamics, and then the third component, which is the convective processes. Within the three、uh, areas, I listed the scientific specific scientific objectives. So in the observation part, I listed three objectives. Okay, and then the, the marks. The red marks means that we have already accomplished some of the uh, proposed uh, objectives, and then, then the the systemax、uh, field campaign、uh, was carried out in different phases. Phases. The first phase is the pilot study that is that was、uh, carried out in 2016 December. And then followed by winter monsoon、uh, observations in December 2017, and then、uh, Bill Lau、uh, suggests us to perform extra、uh, campaign for aerosol monsoon study. So that was done in 2018、uh, March to April, and then the last one is the summer monsoon、uh, in 2018、uh, May to June periods. Okay, so so I listed some of the the papers that、uh, published. So so this the 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 more detailed title and the journals are listed here in the following two slides. The first seven papers is already published in a special issue of Systemax in our geophysical、uh, science journal called the Tau. Terrestrial atmosphere, ocean, and then also we have other publications that、uh, in the past two to three years are、uh, related to the systemax and the 
uh, S two S, which means seasonal subseasonal uh, research. Okay, so for for today's talk, I'm going to uh, talk three subjects, uh, which covers the the objective, large scale two, and the convective scale two, which is the influences of convectively coupled Kevin waves so, on multi scale rainfall variability. This research is uh, reported by uh, Wei Ting Chen, myself. And also, we carry out a modeling study by the MPAS global model, which is uh, 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 also by uh, Xu Li Huan and colleagues. And then the second topic I'm going to talk about is the, the L1 uh, subject with objectives, which is tropical, extratropical interaction. Specific title is effect of the MGO on um, East Asian winter rainfall as revealed by SVD analysis. This is uh, work done by Yunlan Chen, Chen Yunlan, and this is uh, near the end of the review process. And then the third subject I'm going to talk about is the, uh, about the ocean measurements. Uh, uh, we collaborate with, uh, sorry, uh, we collaborate with uh, Professor Jensen and colleagues in the Ocean Institute, NTU. So we, uh, they, they deploy a mooring near the Taiping Island during the system X for about a year. So we, uh, from the ADCP, we observed the uh, uh, clear intra-seasonal oscillation in the central South China Sea. So this uh, result has been published in uh, recent in scientific reports. So, uh, so start with the first subject, which is the influence of convective coupled carbon waves. During uh, the, the pilot period, which is December 2016, uh, we observed <coughs> very pronounced uh, carbon wave activities and also uh, other convectively coupled waves. Okay, so we also uh, did a similar analysis uh, in the 2017 uh, winter, which is our uh, uh, winter monsoon uh, uh, period. So that uh, analysis was reported in, uh, in my uh, paper published in the Spatial Tau issue 2020. Okay, so we focus on this particular event uh, reported by Wei Ting. Uh, and also the modeling paper by uh, Li Huan. Uh, so the, 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 the highlight of the analysis in this December uh, as, as shown by this uh, uh, hot model diagram, that uh, the, the, the equatorial cavern waves as, as, shown by, as shown by this uh, uh, space-time filtered uh, marks which shows uh, the in time and the uh, uh, zonal direction uh, along the equator uh, by this white uh, uh, elongated circle, K1 wave two and the K1 wave three. And other uh, shading in this shows actually the OIR, the total OIR in degree, five degree, to uh, 15 degree nodes, okay? So this is uh, the slight nodes of the equator. So that the OIR shows the, the other convective waves. And the, the, the thin contour in this uh, half moral diagram. Excuse me. Uh, the, the same contour here is the, the contour of the zonal wing at 925 along the equator. So that along with the, 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 the solid contour of space-time filtered uh, marks showing the Kevin wave and the Rossby waves. Okay, so this uh, overall, uh, the convective coupled Kevin wave scale interactions, we we uh, mark four interaction events by the star sign 
the, the first interaction event, the second uh, interaction, the third and the fourth. Okay, let's focus on the, sec the second and third, which may be uh, easier to show in this diagram. This is very busy, but uh, let's focus on seven through 10th, okay, about five days. So you see uh, the, 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 the contour here mark the uh, MRG TD type disturbance that propagate from the Western Pacific westward toward the Philippine area. Okay, and then it enters the South China Sea. And then uh, because of the arrival of this uh, uh, TD type disturbance and also the prevailing northwesterly uh, uh, monsoons, uh, northeasterly monsoons, so there's the formation of bony vortex around the December 9th. Okay, so this is a scale interaction that the, the TD type disturbance that initiate the bony, uh, bony vortex. And then again, you'll see this uh, red arrow here indicate the zonal wind, okay? So this uh, bony vortex, the, 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 the southern bony vortex, the westerly wind, uh, coincide with the, the westerly uh, burst. So it caused a, a TD uh, disturbance. Okay, so this is the first, uh, the second interaction you had. And the, the second column is the simulation at the impasse. Okay, and then this third column here shows the, the, the third interaction uh, event, which is uh, starting from uh, mid December. You see this Kevin wave two that propagate eastward, and then it meet with the prevailing uh, trade wind, very pre uh, strong, persistent uh, trade wind. So this actually form a very uh, uh, cyclonic uh, shear. So as a result, uh, there's a east east uh, Rossby wave, and also uh, the TD type disturbance formed due to this interaction. And eventually, a uh, tropical cyclone Nakhan was formed uh, in this uh, system. So this is uh, uh, the the two intro uh, dominant interaction event. The other one, like the 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 Rossby wave and interaction with the Sumatra and also the southwest wind and coastal convection, and the fourth interaction event is. Uh, Enhanced westerly and convection over the West Sumatra. Okay, so that we we are, we'll skip the details. Okay. And so the the model result we don't have time to look into, but I'm just summarize the result uh, from the study. So the MPAS is uh, able to simulate the overall uh, uh, spatial and temporal evolution of the rainfall and the circulation that include the equatorial Kevin waves and the interaction with uh, equatorial Rossby wave and off equatorial TV type disturbance up to a five to seven day lead. Okay, we use two uh, versions. One is the nearly uniform 60 kilometer resolution. Another one is a, a variable resolution with a fine resolution focusing on Western Pacific and then and stretched to about 60 kilometer globally. Okay, so both, now the, both versions perform uh, similarly. But for the two interaction events, uh, the MPAS uh, variable resolution uh, tends to produce stronger precipitation and the more coherent vorticity structure. This tends to be a, a passive bias. And increasing the resolution to 15 kilometers uh, contributes to a better representation of uh, finer spatial vorticity and uh, rainfall structure. Okay. And then uh, we also uh, waiting also carry out uh, the modulation of diurnal cycle by the Kevin waves. I think uh, this has been uh, a subject of a uh, lot of studies, uh, especially for the maritime continent areas, uh, and especially after the YMC uh, uh, project, because uh, the the maritime continent has the world most active rainfall uh, in the in in the world and uh, 
and the, the, the islands uh, spanning in such a huge uh, oceanic maritime continent area actually produce uh, the strongest diurnal cycle. Actually, the diurnal cycle uh, has the strongest contribution to the rainfall compared to other uh, large-scale disturbances. So this, uh, this is a specific case study for the Kevin wave that modulate diurnal cycle. So the, per the first panel is very straightforward. We just divide the Kevin waves. So when the Kevin waves is active in the western part of the maritime continent, enclosed by this uh, square here, and then the, the eastern part is suppressed. And then the next phase is when the Kevin wave moves eastward, and the eastern parts become convective, and the western parts become uh, suppressed. Okay, and then the, the second uh, row of figure shows the diurnal amplitude uh, for the corresponding to the this convective uh, Kevin wave phase. Okay, so we'll see that uh, comparing this, so amplitude of diurnal cycle generally uh, uh, similar to the total rainfall, okay, indicating indeed diurnal cycle actually in this maritime continent equatorial region is most pronounced, the most important contributor to the rainfall. And then the, this is the phase of the diurnal cycle during the two phases. So uh, there are many interesting features. Uh, for example, uh, like uh, people know that uh, there's a very clear propagation, a general tendency for diurnal convection to start it uh, in the afternoon and then become convective and then mature and then propagating offshore into the neighboring ocean from late evening to early morning. Okay, so this uh, this kind of propagation is uh, well noted. And then if you see uh, the box, the red dashed line, the boxes here, uh, all shows that uh, for the Borneo for the Sumatra, for the Java Island, and for New Guinea. So all these uh, major islands, you see similar kind of uh, modulation of diurnal cycle. People have noted that this, this kind of propagation of coast maybe uh, is related to the prevailing wind, offshore or onshore wind, okay? So, and the timing of, of in the bottom uh, part of the diurnal, timing of the diurnal cycle shows that, uh, for example, in, in Borneo area, uh, this, uh, the warm color indicate that in the, the late evening, uh, and then the, the blue color shows late early morning, so there's a clear uh, propagation out of to, to both the sea. So this is kind of a, a specific modulation by Kevin waves. Okay, so there are some very interesting uh, uh, processes that uh, uh, involve in this uh, Kevin wave or maybe other large scale disturbance modulating the diurnal cycle. And, uh, and the one thing I we noted that in our MPEX model simulation, this type of diurnal cycle interaction with the large scale disturbance, the Kevin wave, are not uh, well simulated. So the model, even at 15 kilometers, which and we have problems. We actually uh, actually use uh, the, the the original the Wolf model, unified Wolf developed at the NASA. We we carry out in the South China Sea region. We use three kilometer resolution. We also cannot simulate such kind of interaction. So this uh, this is something we have to. I think uh, we know that the the. the topography and resolution and the physics are all very important for such kind of scale interaction. So this is the, the, the highlight of the maritime continent diurnal cycle. Uh, I, I will not uh, read it anymore, we'll come to the next subject, which is the effect of MGO on the East Asian winter rainfall. Uh, we use uh, SVD analysis to identify the MGO phases. Uh, we, for the data handling, we follow the widely used IM indices. So we use for the IM indices uh, that uh, Wheeler and Hendon uh, developed, they, we call that the IM or Wheeler Hendon 204 
published the paper. So they use uh, the oil arm and the zonal wing at 850 and 200. And they average these three fields from 15 south to 15 north. And then and then to combine the all, for e- all day, all years, not, 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 including all winter and the summer seasons, and then ap- apply the combined EOF. And then they obtain the, the first and second mode, or EOF mode, that they use the corresponding PC as the uh, MGO index. This is widely used. And for this study, we focus on the winter time. So we can do the same thing, but only use winter data, December, January, February, March, okay. And then for the SVD method, we use the same data set, but we didn't do the so the, the average, instead we used the two dimensional field, okay. So for the for the OIR, uh, we use 15 to 15 nodes, just like the, the RM indices. Uh, for, the, for the wind, we extend from 15 south to 30 nodes. We extend 15 degrees to the nodes, okay. And then we apply the same thing as BD analysis, we obtain. So then we composite, uh, we perform the, the, the probability distribution of the rainfall for each phases. So the top panel shows based on the phases, based on the uh, IM indices, winter, okay, IM winter index. And the lower panel shows the SBD uh, phases. And then for each phase, the rainfall are, are expressed here in four quartiles, okay. The first quartile, the second quartile, the third quartile, and the, the medium and the mean are shown here. So if we compare these two, uh, the F- SVD is able to show a more conspicuous and coherent evolution of the rainfall distribution uh, compared to the IM indices. So this is one of the features we show uh, because we want to see how the MGO in different phases can uh, influence East Asian rainfall. So the next one is to show the, the relationship. So what we do here, I just show one of the composite uh, figures performed in this uh, study. So we use, this is a very similar phase diagram. This is PC2 and this is PC1. Oh, this is PC1 and this is PC2 from SVD. So and we found out that from SVD analysis, the PC2 is a very important mode. So we c- consider uh, for the PC2 must, 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 must have amplitude larger than one standard deviation. And then, so this is SVD phase one and the two, and this is SVD phase three and the four. And then the composite low level uh, precipitation and the wind is shown here. Okay, so you see that in the SVD phase one, two, the most clear uh, signal is the suppressed convection or cooling in the maritime continent and western Pacific area, okay, from 20 nodes to, to, to uh, 10, uh, 20 south to 10 nodes, okay. And then for the SVD phase three and the four, the most important signal is the convection over the Indian Ocean, where well, it has slightly uh, negative phase in the American. MCWP. So the SVD analysis identified the MGO phase of suppressed conversion of the MCWP, namely the phase one, two, as a very critical signal uh, before the linear ocean uh, convection take over. And previous study mostly emphasized that this is the phase that the conversion over the, in, the, the Indian, Indian Ocean that can influence the East Asian rainfall. Okay, and in uh, in the previous talk, Eric talked about this uh, notch, the tropical forcing and the influence on the uh, the rainfall in the West Coast or you know, North America. I think that seems to me is like a propagating MGO uh, from the this phase three four, and then maybe to to the next phase where you, the the central. Uh, Pacific has a very pronounced precipitation, so it has a downstream influence. But in this case, we're well, interested in the, the, the effect of the MGO on the East Asian rainfall. 
So we found that SVD phase one, two, the, the, the cooling in the maritime county in Western Pacific is pronounced, is dominant. So we carry out a, a false experiment using a linear biophysical model, which is a global model. Okay. Uh, uh, three minutes, please. Okay, we have three minutes left. Okay. So, uh, so this you can see that if we just apply a cooling in the MCWP region, and the response is similar to uh, what we uh, the com previous composite analysis. So we conclude that the, the MCWP cooling and the result and the low level anticyclonic flow in that with the East Asian jet leading to an overall weakening of the East Asian wind and monsoon circulation that is a more direct cause of enhanced East Asian rainfall than the Indian heating induced rust river interaction. Okay. And then the, for the third component, I don't think I have time to go over just quickly that in the in Taiping Island is uh, somewhere over here. So near Taiping Island, we install an AD uh, mooring and that has an ADCP that can measure, look upward, can measure the upper ocean uh, current. The right panel shows the depth average current. The top one is uh, Zono. The, the middle one is Mariano, and the, the, the low one is temperature. So you see this is from 20, uh, 2017 January to December. So you see uh, from the wind and temperature, it's a very clear, about 50 day oscillation. And then uh, we, the, we, uh, we look at the, the sea level uh, anomaly signal across the, the basin, South China Sea Basin in time. And then the sea appear to be a pulse of waves that originated from uh, from the the western eastern part and propagate eastward and then turns out that uh, uh, in this, is it related to the this philippine island palawan which is parallel almost parallel with the southwestly monsoons so so the, for the intra-seasonal uh, southwestly uh, flow that uh, goes up and down following uh, intra-seasonal uh, uh, scale, uh, that uh, the Ekman transport can kind of pile the water up against the coast, goes up and down. That appear to be a source to, to uh, force a uh, rust that actually propagate the westward, uh, as shown by this uh, uh, westward moving uh, sea level anomaly signal here. So that's the key uh, uh, finding. And then uh, Professor Danson performed some region ocean modeling and forced the model by a similar kind of forcing. And indeed, he's able to produce these vessel moving waves. So this is the uh, observed the interesting lesson in the South China Sea. The highlight is that in the red here, the summer southwesterly monsoon strengthening and weakening and the resultant Ackerman pumping velocity and show where Ackerman transport increase and decrease, and the consequent coastal sea level rise and fall of the west coast of Palawan create westward propagating raspy wave, causing velocity oscillation in the central South China Sea. Okay, uh, okay, this is uh, our end here. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Sui. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, anyone with questions to Professor Sui? Please come up. Anyone? Eric, you want to ask questions? <laughs> uh, you can move to the blue broadcaster symbol if you want to. Uh, ask questions, yes, or or you come up stage. Uh, down one, yes, yes. Uh, no, no, no. Okay, uh, Eric, come up stage. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, very well. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I I lost the route to the blue uh, screen. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> it's okay. The stage is larger. Thanks. <laughs> That's a very nice talk. Um, I, you made a comment about not being able to simulate the diurnal swap cycle properly, even with a three or four kilometer model. And I, I thought that was interesting because I, we actually found the same thing. We've been using RAMs near the Philippines. And even with a one kilometer grid spacing model, we've been having a hard time simulating offshore propagation. And so I, I think we've been finding very similar things. <laughs> yeah, perhaps uh, Wei Ting and uh, Professor Chen Ming Wu, uh, they, have, they are supervising a student working on this uh, uh, scale awareness of the uh, cumulus parameterization problems. Maybe that can partially solve the problems. Maybe we can have some time to talk about that later. <laughs> yes. Thank you for advertising for my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, Professor Sui, thank you very much. Please uh, stay on stage. And uh, uh, I think we will uh, directly move on to the discussion uh, of this um, YMC session. So originally in the fifth YMC scientific workshop, uh, we expect to have about an entire afternoon and all the scientists will gather uh, around and, and talk about future uh, programs. And um, unfortunately, uh, I think today we, we will only get a flavor of it. Uh, so in the next, uh, I think, uh, 20 minutes or 15 minutes, we will uh, go through some uh, specific topics. I, oops, yeah, I listed uh, three things and I already uh, compiled a list with the help of Kunio and uh, John Xidong and uh, Eric uh, about the upcoming uh, sessions uh, with YMC or Maritime Continent in uh, some major scientific conference. And also, uh, we will cover a little bit about the field campaigns in the future. And then we will open the floor to everyone if you want to propose or mention some of your ongoing activities that you think are relevant to Maritime Continent or Monsoon, MJL, or uh, subseasonal to seasonal forecast, etc. So please allow me to... Uh, uh, show this list. Um, so this is what, uh, if you uh, are looking for some conference in, uh, in the upcoming uh, months, and here are some uh, lists for your consideration. So uh, very quickly at the end of this month, we will have the Camp 2X Piston Science Team meetings, and it will be online, I believe. And then uh, at the end of this year, the, during the AGU4 meetings, we have two sessions uh, about MC and the MJO and uh, convectively coupled waves, uh, two sessions related. And I, I believe the AGU and both the AMS will be hybrid format, meaning both uh, the real uh, meeting and also online uh, meeting will take place together. So uh, earlier next uh, January, we will have the AMS uh, uh, and there will be, as usual, the symposium on MJL and subseasonal monsoon variability. And also I think the Richard Johnson Simpson, uh, Sim symposium, sorry, symposium will also cover uh, relevant um, topics related to the YMC. And next year in May, the Hurricane Conference, uh, uh, Qidong and I and many of our colleagues are uh, organizing a session that specifically focused on uh, the processes in the Indo-Pacific maritime continent regions. So we encourage uh, the audience, everyone, or help us advertise these sessions a little bit. And some of the deadlines are approaching, so please submit and attend, and hopefully we can continue this uh, scientific interactions with each other. Okay, anyone wants to add um, if I miss any uh, thing with the meeting? So if, if you want to chime in, you can just briefly walk up to the stage and, and talk to everyone. Uh, okay, so, 
The next thing, so Cunha already showed this uh, long list of uh, um, past and ongoing and hopefully will happen <laughs> field experiments in, in this uh, uh, maritime continent, South China Sea area. And um, I think uh, we will uh, talk about some of the upcoming field campaigns. So uh, Professor Sui, you want to talk about a little bit about the joint uh, ocean vessel observation uh, in next January over South China Sea. I have the slides for you. It's Professor Sui here. You want to come off stage? Yes. Are you trapped? <laughs> Uh, okay, then I'll do it for him very quickly. Okay. So, like, okay. Yeah, can ah, you? Okay, okay. You, can you see my slides? Uh, yeah, not you, yet. Can, you can just. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Not yet. Maybe you can just go over it if we have problem. Time is limited. Uh. Oh yeah, this one here, I, I see. You, you click on it and it will blow yeah, up. Yes. yes, can you see it now? Yes. Yeah, this is the cruise plan that already, uh, yeah. okay, that's already approved by the most uh, Ministry of Science and Technology. So this cruise will take place uh, in January uh, next year. So it's well, uh, the, the new ocean research one, uh, that's the NTU uh, uh, ocean research vessel that will uh, start it from Kaohsiung, okay, and then going south following this uh, this track. So first it'll go to uh, to the east, and then turn south, and then turn west, and then going through the Bass Strait, straight, and then going uh, south westward uh, in, into South China Sea, and then comes around. So this is mostly for the biogeochemistry uh, experiment. So they will stop at each of the stations, uh, take water samples. Okay, I heard that each uh, operation takes about six hours, depending on how many samples they will take and go around. So this whole cruise will take about two weeks. So we plan to, uh, so we, we our proposal is to perform uh, uh, measurement for the boundary layer structures during the cold surges. So this timing is very good because uh, we're, we perform some analysis for uh, four years uh, of uh, cold surges. And then most of the cold surge that stem from the uh, Mongolian and, and the northern uh, Asia and they come southward and then normally from late December through January, most of the stronger cold surge occurs. So we plan to uh, uh, deploy uh, some, something we call mini uh, sounding uh, developed by Ocean Bing at NTU, we call that storm tracker. So that's perfect for uh, boundary layer measurement. So it's cheap. I heard that's about one tenth of the cost of the, uh, the, the, the sounding uh, equipment. So we can uh, launch more uh, sounds, and then uh, in the box to measure the boundary layer structure, wind and thermodynamic structures. And then also uh, uh, Professor Xu at the Ocean Institute will launch this uh, so-called EM apex flows. Okay, so it can measure the upper ocean uh, structure, current, everything. And then uh, along with uh, some other uh, uh, satellite data, and uh, we are hoping that we can collaborate with the Philippine people, Pagasa scientists, so we can uh, use uh, some of the, 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 the radar station and the, the, the upper air sounding station to form some array, if possible, to, to do some uh, joint observation. So that's the plan. This is for the cold search and the boundary layer. Okay. So uh, thank you. So, uh, Kunio, do you also want to talk about the proposed cruise plan by Jamstack uh, in more details? Kunio, are you still with us? 
Yes. Uh, okay. I will share my slide again. Uh oh. Can you see my slide? Yes, perfect. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, my colleague Satoru Yokoi proposed as a uh, representative on behalf of our group uh, trying to get a sip time for Mirai again. And uh, in the uh, Boreal summer uh, from May to early August in 2023, uh, two years later, uh, at that time, the uh, uh, we are planning to conduct the uh, two missions. One is the uh, uh, Mars observation platform deploy the uh, station one along the 13 degree north and the 173 degree east. Uh, actually, this, uh, I'm not sure many of you may know that uh, uh, deck right now, the, we draw the uh, Triton buoy in tropical western Pacific. But uh, instead, we still keep the one more system uh, this area we call it the Philippine Sea Boy, but anyway, or it's the uh, same, almost same as the uh, M Triton Boy. And uh, during this cruise, we try to deploy the uh, not only this uh, maintain this buoy, but also several new technology, uh, including uh, some glider or something. We deploy and uh, to try to establish the measurement system around this region. This is a uh, just trial, uh, mainly meant for the contribution to the T POS project and. Uh, and then, uh, so by the uh, Palau, Kalol Palau, then uh, change to the uh, second reg, and uh, we try to uh, conduct the seasonal observation uh, slightly uh, higher uh, latitude comparing to the uh, BSM 2020 or 2018. Uh, almost same latitude along the lower northern part, uh, northern Philippines, like this. Uh, we shift to the subtropical area. But uh, our main time is the same, uh, BCSO, uh, Boreal Summer Interseasonal Situation. But uh, a tight relation, uh, we look at the uh, relationship between the compact activity over this region to the middle latitude. So maybe, hopefully, as far as we can get a safe time enough, uh, we want to deploy those areas about one month. At that time, we also intend to deploy the uh, wave grader, as I showed for our Parsi cruise. And uh, also, we request uh, the collabor collaboration with the civil uh, maritime council countries, uh, as we did for 2020, uh, for with the station at Yarp and the uh, in Palau, as well as the uh, collaboration with the Pagasa in Philippines. And uh, in addition, during this of the, uh, cruise, uh, we intend to conduct the uh, uh, another uh, super high, uh, late, uh, special radio sound again. At, uh, in, uh, not on board the uh, Mirai, but uh, uh, hopefully uh, we want to conduct the observation at uh, Lawar as well. So may maybe uh, we try to organize or form a new observation network again in this region. And uh, But uh, we are not sure when uh, such a decision will be made, but uh, hopefully as far as we can get a safe time, I think that we can announce uh, such a uh, observation plan to YMC or any other uh, science community as well. That's it. Okay, thank you. Let me show. So uh, that's the Jamstack uh, plane for uh, 2023. So uh, I think uh, Chi Dong mentioned about the US uh, uh, cruise in the Banda Sea, and uh, it's kind of post still uh, postponed, and the new date would probably be the end of 2022. Okay, and then the UK uh, uh, Terra Maris fill campaign, uh, I think Neil also mentioned in his talk, uh, is also postponed to 2023. So I guess overall, hopefully at the end of 2022 to earlier to mid uh, 2023, we will resume some uh, major scientific observation activities over the maritime continent area. So let's uh, keep our fingers crossed and then uh, also keep in touch with each other uh, to continue this YMC efforts. Anyone wants to add something in case I miss? Okay, so um, I guess, uh, yeah.
Uh, the last thing is uh, any modeling activities or ongoing research topics you want to um, bring to our attention or uh, want to advocate uh, using, we have two or three minutes. So I think in Taiwan, uh, we actually have um, many people working on uh, the monsoon and convection and uh, from like uh, severe weather time scale to the longer um, intra-seasonal time scale. So, so I, I think uh, the YMC talks today will offer a lot of um, stimulations and uh, to everybody here. Okay, so um, I think uh, the, the Gather Town format is um, to provide interactions for everyone. So please uh, continue to uh, chat with your colleagues and, and then maybe meet some new friends here in the virtual NTUAS department if, if you haven't been here before. Uh, and um, okay, so I think we will uh, have a five minute break. Sorry for a very um, uh, sharp time. So uh, I will, uh, we will move on to our regular talk sessions in uh, 11 a.m. at Taipei. So please take a short break and then come back. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Waiting. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, Professor Chen Zhaoming, if you want to test your screen sharing or, uh, yes, yes, I see you. Chen Zhaoming, do you want to open the microphone first? Yes, yes, yes. 啊,真是。好,那我現在試試看好了。好。哦,我試看看。现在有看到您的整个桌面，所以您切到您的PPT，对，然后播放。有了，现在是可以，然后下面那个那一条把它按最右边隐藏，下面中间，对对对对，这样可以了，这样就可以了，对，好，谢谢，你请那个一起过来
Okay, so um, everyone, we need, we are about to start. Um, the second half of the YMC session will consist of uh, three regular talks. Each will be 15 minutes. So I will be the first one, and hopefully you can all see my uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so my name is Wei Ting Chen. I'm from National Taiwan University. So uh, under the support of Taiwan uh, Most, and also the Central Weather Bureau. We have been studying the multi-scale processes of organized convections over the South China Sea and the maritime continent areas. So uh, we collaborate very closely with uh, um, my colleague, um, Jian Ming Wu in NTU and also uh, Dr. Chen Jianhe in Central Weather Bureau. And the uh, work I present today are uh, mainly carried out by our uh, PhD student, master's student, uh, and research assistants in, in uh, our department. And uh, I also want to thank uh, some colleagues in uh, our department and also in CSU. So uh, in Taiwan and also I think in the, the broad maritime continent uh, or the Asian Australian monsoon regions, we are seeing, uh, very, we are experiencing very, very similar uh, conditions um, during the wet season. So this is a particular um, summer uh, satellite images. Uh, and uh, in this particular day, there is a coastal uh, convection, mesoscale convection systems happening uh, in the Southwest coast of Taiwan. And then uh, we will see very, uh, uh, strong convection, organized convection uh, on the radar, and also producing a severe uh, uh, flood in the metropolitan areas uh, close to the coastal regions. So I think uh, this is not a, a, a small scale thing. It's actually uh, related to the large scale moisture supply uh, from the monsoon flow, uh, which crossed uh, the, the hemisphere across the, uh, the equator and supply water uh, moisture uh, all the way to the East Asia. And uh, we can see along this uh, corridor of moisture, uh, intense uh, organized convections will happen along many of these coastlines, uh, Taiwan or even further downstream of uh, Kyushu Island in, in um, uh, Japan. And uh, during the, the boreal summer, we will see this uh, transport of water vapor varies uh, in slower timescales, maybe in the biweekly or even uh, intraseasonal timescales, modulating uh, these uh, synoptic scale weather or the, the extreme uh, rainfall uh, over different regions. And even to a broader scale, this is part of the regional heli circulation during the boreal winter. And then when the season uh, evolves, we will see uh, the, the southern hemispheric part of the, uh, of the maritime continent, also in the Australian coast, uh, will have similar uh, events happen. So the focus of uh, our research in uh, this recent years under the systems project is to study the multi-scale processes of these uh, very intense organized convections over the coastal regions. So here I'm referring to not only the uh, coastal uh, large MCS systems, but also the uh, very strong diurnally active um, convections over the complex topographies of these coastlines and islands. So um, in our previous uh, work, we already demonstrate through satellite and the uh, cloud resolving model uh, simulations that these uh, coastal convections plays a key role in the moisture buildup processes during the South China Sea summer monsoon onset. And Professor Sui also showed some of our works that uh, showing the modulation of MJL diurnal cycle rainfall by the convectively coupled Kelvin waves. So we have seen this uh, uh, tight coupling between these coastal convections to the large scale uh, variability or the large scale circulation. And 
Uh, today, I'm going to uh, very quickly show some of our recent works uh, that uh, uh, trying to connect the tropical organized convection in the coastal area to the large scale and also to how they produce the extreme rainfall. So I will not uh, cover the details of these studies, but I will show you the lessons we learned from these studies and then also how I see these uh, studies connect to each other. So the first two uh, works, uh, we explore the relationship between the extreme rainfall and the coastal uh, extensive MCS and their relationship with the synoptic flow pattern or the monsoon circulation, mainly using the satellite observations of the multi-year data set from train, precipitation radar, and also the cloud set. So my student, Jian Hongwen, has uh, identified uh, more than 900 extremely extensive and intense rainfall systems from the train PR observations over the Asian Australian monsoon regions. And we subjectively classify these uh, extreme convection systems uh, based on their uh, synoptic flow patterns and also their vicinity to the coastlines. And we can uh, clearly see that the synoptic flow patterns and these coastal topographies providing, uh, are providing the key ingredients for generating the extreme rainfall systems over these uh, AAM regions. And we can see that many of these coastal re uh, related types, they are, uh, their presence are highly seasonal and uh, the, the location uh, is very consistent with the seasonal area of high column water vapor and low level vertical wind shear, which provide favorable conditions for mesoscale organization. We also look at, uh, at the internal structures of these uh, extreme precipitation systems. And in the next work, uh, my student Peng Ren, he took a very different approach. So we used a data-driven approach that we objectively uh, classified using the cluster analysis uh, to uh, identify the cloud regimes uh, of over um, 0.1 million uh, convective cloud systems in uh, the cloud set observations. So uh, we see that uh, a, a very clear, uh, unique, highly extensive uh, regime pop up in this uh, cluster analysis. So these uh, systems, they happened mainly in the coastal oceans of the uh, maritime continent and the, the Mersu region. So uh, we named them uh, as the coastal intense regime. So the, the, their horizontal uh, scale can be well over 1,000 kilometers. And with this clustering, we also see these coastal intense regimes. They are uh, highly associated with extreme rainfall in the precipitation uh, uh, spectrum. And also their occurrence is tightly coupled to the seasonal change of the monsoon circulations. Okay. So despite the close relationship and the importance of these uh, tropical coastal convections to the large scale and also to uh, the regional uh, extreme rainfall events, uh, the current uh, global models still underrepresent uh, these coastal convection systems and also the uh, diurnal convections over these regions. And in our previous work, we have identified the bias uh, in the CAM5 uh, model and also in the earlier version of the Central Weather Bureau uh, global forecast systems uh, in representing the convections and diurnal cycle in South China Sea area, and that also leads to the bias in the simulated summer monsoon. And even for uh, the more, uh, uh, even for the, the SPCAM, which uh, kind of resolved the, the convection using the uh, 2D CRM, we are seeing a, a bias in the simulated uh, monsoon, and we identify that the air-sea interactions plays in a critical role in the coupling between the convection and the large scale. Uh, circulation. And continue this line, we um, want to improve the uh, representation of convections uh, in, in the global models. 
And also, we keep uh, we want to uh, further identify if such bias uh, still exists in some of the uh, the, the most state-of-the-art global cloud-resolving models in the Diamond projects. So uh, our PhD student, uh, advised by Professor Wu Jianming, uh, so the student Su Junyan, so they have been implementing uh, the unified uh, convection uh, parentization and also the P3 microphysics into the Central Weather Bureau uh, global uh, forecast systems. So this is an in-house developed AGCN at gray zone resolution about 15 kilometers. And we want to develop this model to, uh, uh, for the uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction. And with this new suite of uh, physics parameterization, we can see that uh, the um, model simulates a better uh, diurnal cycle over the land areas of the American continent. So in the upper left here, that's the uh, observation from the satellite for the diurnal peak time over these uh, American continent islands. And uh, on the lower left, that's the new Central Weather Bureau GFS uh, with the unified convection. And upper right is the original version. So you can see there's clear improvements uh, in representing the, uh, the the timing of these diurnal cycles, and also the amplitude uh, uh, is also significantly uh, improved. And the key here is uh, the unified convection. They can uh, uh, smoothly transition uh, the rainfall in the afternoon from the more parameterized dominated rainfall production uh, to the grayscale productions at night. And we think this uh, actually uh, provides important insights to the uh, processes that the model needs to resolve or parameterize for these uh, uh, diurnal cycle processes. So continue uh, this work, we uh, simulate, uh, we use the Central Weather Bureau model uh, and carry out the same 40-day uh, hindcast as the Diamond Global Cloud Resolving uh, into comparison experiments. So uh, we use uh, the metrics we developed uh, from the satellite uh, to uh, look at how these models represent the organized uh, convection systems. And we found that uh, most of the models, uh, both the Diamond models and the Central Weather models, they simulate insufficient number of large systems over the maritime continent ocean. And uh, the, the Central Weather Bureau models uh, uh, over land uh, captures the, uh, the contribution of the large uh, systems during the, the diurnal cycle evolution. Uh, but most of these diamond models underestimate the contribution, uh, which is the yellow part uh, along the diurnal cycle evolution. So uh, also we found that the, most of these uh, uh, high resolution models have unrealistic sensitivities of precipitation uh, extremes to the precipitation size. So definitely, I think the, the global cloud resolving models are not resolving. Uh, so, so I think they, although they resolve very fine scale processes, but they also open up a, a more degree of freedoms for the physics to interact. Okay. So in the last part, uh, we want to look into further the physical processes that uh, relate to the to these uh, convections to the extreme rainfalls, and we we know that uh, over these regions, the synaptic conditions will modulate whether the coastal uh, MCS. Uh, over the ocean will uh, pop up or the land uh, diurnal cycle will be more active. So we designed some scenario-based assessment to perturb these systems a little bit with the aerosols and see how the extreme, extreme rainfalls uh, respond. So I'm running out of time, so I will uh, move on to the, uh, the, the, the uh, land diurnal cycle uh, questions. So here, my student uh, Zhang Yuhong is carrying out uh, these uh, studies, focusing on uh, the summertime uh, weak synaptic conditions of afternoon thunderstorm over time one. So we carry out semi-realistic LES uh, scale simulations. And these simulations can very nicely capture the hotspots of these orographically developed convections uh, with 
uh, the active uh, diurnal rainfall. And with the different scenarios of the CCN, we can see the uh, number of extreme systems uh, increases significantly over these uh, hotspot areas because the aerosol effects is delaying the convection initiation over uh, the, the mountain valleys and then uh, leads to a further organization of these uh, diurnal cycle systems. So this is a quick uh, overview of our recent work. I uh, hope we show you that the importance of these uh, coastal rainfall systems. And then we know that the, the global models still have a lot of problems in simulating this uh, important phenomenon. And, and, but I think the uh, success of the UNIFI scheme is providing very important insight to some of the key processes. And we advocate for carefully selecting the synaptic regimes to look at the response of extreme rainfall in the systems to the change in the environment. So uh, we will continue this line of research uh, to look at not only the microphysics, but also uh, maybe in the future, we will do the pseudo global warming experiments to look at these coastal convection and also uh, the land use change. So the last two uh, posters I want to advocate for this afternoon uh, is uh, continuing the, this uh, line of research, so uh, Xiao Yu will show you how he tracked the Himari uh, satellite uh, to look at the life cycle of precipitation systems over the Northwest Pacific monsoon period. And uh, Qi Huan is uh, working on the model intercomparisons uh, for four uh, models we, uh, we hosted in Taiwan. And uh, this is the project mentioned by Professor Hong Mong Bai yesterday. And we want to look at the short-term bias of MJO in these four models with very different convection representations. Okay, so this is all for my talk and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Anyone in the audience? Are you still with me? Sorry, I think I talked too long. Any quick questions? Or maybe you can talk to me privately. Minghui, yes. What? Well, talk to the uh, private yes. Yeah, exactly. Many <laughs> <laughs> Too many questions. I will talk to you later. No. <laughs> yeah, I will talk to you later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe we should move on. Okay. <laughs> Let me uh, stop sharing. So uh, our next talk uh, is by Professor Chen Zhaoming, also under the Systems Project. Uh, he's from the National Kaohsiung University, and he will talk about the uh, track variability of South China Sea uh, tropical cyclones. So, Professor Chen, please start. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Zhao Ming Chen. Uh, I'm going to present track variability of South China Sea from the tropical cyclones, uh, related by seasonal and uh, intra-seasonal circulations. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Professors Lin and Sui and uh, Mr. Wu uh, from the National Taiwan University. Uh, excuse me, Professor Chen. Yes. I think you need to share your full screen uh, window. Okay. Yeah. Is this okay? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this activity in the South China Sea is intense. Uh, that is next to uh, tropical Western Pacific. It's a major teach season is from May to uh, November, with a mass bar phase in September. Uh, this mass bar phase is different from that in the Western Pacific. 
that occurs in uh, Ju July or August, depends on the region. And then uh, for the TC track here, uh, we can separate this uh, uh, South China Sea phone, the track of the South, South China Sea phone, the TCs, into uh, several major types. Uh, we can see the northeastward into the uh, Philippines and the Taiwan, or northward into uh, southern China, uh, northwestward into uh, southwestern China, or westward into uh, Indo China Peninsula. So in this study, we separated these uh, TC tracks into three major types northeastward, northward, and westward plus northwestward. So the first question is um, how to measure TC tracks vary with the uh, seasonal cycle? So for the major TC season from May to November, uh, this period, period can can cover uh, this, this period covers the three uh, uh, monsoon season. The one is uh, pre monsoon season from May June, and then the southwestern monsoon season from July to September, and then the northeastern monsoon season from October to November. Okay, so in the pre monsoon season, uh, the major TC track in May is uh, northeastward. In June, TC track changes from northeastward into uh, west northwestward. In the southwest monsoon season, there are two major TC tracks. The dominant one is west northwestward. The second one is uh, northward. And then uh, in the northeast eastern monsoon season, there is only one major TC track. That's a uh, northwest northwestward. So from this table, we can see very clear that. There is, there is an evident seasonal variability in the TC track of the South China Sea phone TC. So our next question is, uh, what is the major cause for the track change during the June? Our analysis shows that in the early June, the major TC track is northeastward. In the late June, the TC track changed into uh, with northwestward. So then uh, we have a composite circulation pattern for the TC cases for the early June and then the later June. And then uh, for this case, uh, we can see that uh, TC, TCs are formed within the cyclonic circulations. Now after the formation, this TC can be uh, driven by the southwesterly or southerly flow to move northeastward. And that's for the early June. For the later June, TCs are surrounded by uh, uh, by cyclonic circulations, and then uh, after formation, these TC are driven uh, by the uh, southeasterly flow to move northwestward or move westward. And then what's the difference between uh, these two circulation composite patterns? So we compute the difference between uh, the composite pattern of the late June and the early June. So we can see uh, from early June to late June, we can see the difference is uh, the is a very strong cyclonic circulation over the South China Sea. So this means the deepening of the monsoon trough over here. And then this, uh, we also uh, compare the climatological flow pattern between the uh, late June and early June. We also can see a cyclonic circulation pattern over the South China Sea. So. This is related to the deepening of the monsoon trough. So from this analysis, we can conclude that the deepening of the monsoon trough is a major cause for the track change from the northeastward from in early June to uh, west northwestward uh, in uh, late June. And then uh, our next question is uh, what are the major features of the steering flow for different uh, track types? So we have uh, the composite pattern of the steering flow at the 500 millibar for the west northwest for the west northwest track types in different season. That's a May, that's a May June, and then the Jays, and then the October November, and then uh, for for these three types, we uh, for these three uh, composite pattern, uh, we can see the common feature is uh, TC tens. TCs tend to uh, form within the cyclonic circulation over the South China Sea. 
And then this saccharic circulation is paired with uh, an anti-saccharic circulation flow to the nose. So after the formation, this TC are blocked by this anti-saccharic circulation to the nose. And so this TC cannot move northward. On the other hand, the easterly flow over here uh, tend to uh, still uh, drive this TC uh, westward or northwestward. So, so we can see the uh, we can see the, the appearance of the anti-saccharic circulation flow over the uh, in the dress and then the, in the November, October and November. For the northeastward dress type, TC tends uh, TCs tend to uh, form within the cyclonic shear over here. So after the formation, this TC can be driven by the southwesterly or southerly flow to move northeastward. And then uh, for the northward trade type, TC tend, uh, TCs tend to form within a close cyclonic flow pattern over here. And then uh, after formation, this TC uh, may uh, move northward into a low pressure zone uh, over the southern China to result in a uh, northward track type. So, and then we also, uh, uh, we, we also want to examine the associate, associated variability in the larger scale monsoon circulation. So the monsoon circulation is then here, uh, the monsoon trough, and then the Western Pacific subtropical high. So now we have uh, the compass pattern on the formation days for different uh, trade type in a different season. And then uh, what we can do, that's uh, we compare the circulation pattern between uh, the compass, compass, uh, compass pattern of the TC cases, that's the uh, radar nice here. And then uh, with the climatological pattern, that's the blue line here. Okay, so for the, in the May and the June, we have a, a west, west, northwest wall trade type and a, a northeast wall trade type. So we compare these two, they have a common feature. Uh, the monsoon shroud uh, tends to intensify eastward for these two types. The difference comes from the subtropical high. For the west northwest wall trade type, the subtropical high tends, tends to uh, intensify westward. So to form an anti cyclonic flow to the north of the, this uh, TC, so they, therefore they may uh, move uh, west and north westward. On the other hand, the subtropical high retreats eastward in the, in the northeastward uh, trade type. So this uh, leaves a space to the north for this TC to move uh, northeastward. And then uh, in JS, we compare the west northwestward trade type and then the northward trade type. And then uh, the major difference comes from the, the monsoon trough. In the west northwestward trade type, the monsoon trough tends to uh, intensify southward. Uh, southward. And then uh, that is accompanied with an westward inten intensification of the subtropic high. So similar to uh, May June, so this TC after form after formation, this TC are driven by the easterly flow to move you know, westward. And then for the north northward trade type, and then the, the monsoon trough tends to intensify northward. And also you can see the the subtropical high uh, retrieved northward. So there is a there is a space to the north for this TC. To, uh, to be driven by the southerly, uh, southwesterly or southerly flow to move northward. And then uh, in October and November, uh, the, the major circulation flow is uh, equatorial trough, okay? So we compare the red line and the blue line, we can, see, um, we can see an intensification of the equatorial trough. So the so TC, uh, TC is, tends to form within this uh, intensified equatorial trough and then, then uh, move uh, westward. So for the ISO modulation, uh, how do ISO modulate, modulate the TC uh, movement? So we had uh, the evolution flow pattern of the ISO from uh, day zero to uh, day four 
digital means uh, the formation day of the TC, uh, the, the day of the TC formation. And then uh, day two, day four means uh, two days and uh, four days after the TC formation. So this uh, for the west north west of trade type uh, in the uh, major and in the JS. So we can see uh, some uh, common feature. So from here we can see a uh, TC are formed within the circling center, uh, within the center of the uh, an elongated uh, 30 to 60 circling anomaly here. After formation, uh, this TC are driven by the easterly flow to move westward along the circling anomaly of the ISO uh, pattern. So we can see uh, uh, so we can see the TC after formation, they are uh, move along with uh, the 30 to 60 days circling anomaly to move to take a westward and northwestward track. Okay, so in just uh, the, the similar pattern we can find, similar result we can find from the JS result. After TC formation uh, occurs within the center of the circling anomaly, after that they move the westward uh, along with the elongated 30 to 60 day circling anomaly. So the general feature uh, we can conclude is here. A 30 to 60 day circling anomaly uh, distributing along the TC tracks, that's here from here westward, to provide a favorable environment for TC development. And then uh, also uh, the 30 to 60 day circling anomaly also provide here, provide persistent student flow, that's uh, easily, easily flow uh, to the nose to guide the teaching movement. And then uh, we also uh, show here another compass pattern for the west north northwest for trade type uh, in the October November season. So we also can see here the elongated 30 to 60 circling anomaly over here. And then the uh, teaching formation over here, after formation, they move along with uh, this uh, ISO anomaly to take a westward, northwestward track. And then uh, for the another different uh, trade type, northeastward and northwest, we, we can see the different uh, different pattern of the ISO anomaly. So for the northeastward trade type, we can see a cyclic anomaly that's here over the South China Sea and the uh, Western North Pacific. And uh, this anomaly has a uh, northeastward extension. So uh, this TC, uh, this uh, TC is uh, formed over the South China Sea after formation. They move northeastward along this uh, extended uh, ISO anomaly uh, to take a northeastward track. And then uh, for the northward track type, uh, we can find a cyclic anomaly over the South China Sea and the Southern China here. So TC, TC formation, after formation, this TC can be driven by the southerly flow to move northward into uh, southern China to result in a uh, northward trade type. So from this result, uh, we uh, conclude that the spatial distribution of the 30 to 60 day second anomaly are important to guide TC movement. So how come the ISO, the spatial pattern of ISO anomaly can uh, can uh, uh, guide the TC movement. So I think uh, they must provide some uh, favorable environment. Okay, so here uh, we, uh, here, uh, we uh, perform the composite analysis for the, TC, for the uh, moisture flux for, uh, on the TC formation day. So, so that's the uh, west northwest northwest with northwestward trade type for different season here, and then the north e northeastward trade type for May June, and the northward trade type for JS. So here the vector is the moist moisture frost, and then the shading is the divergence of the moisture frost, and then uh, we have a shading here that's a ne negative value. So the negative value indicates the moisture convergence. So we can see here on the formation day, they, they are uh, anomalous moisture convergence uh, along, along this uh, ISO anomaly here. 
and then uh, so also here and here. And then uh, for the northeastward north eastward trade type, we can see uh, moisture, uh, moisture, convergence anomalies appears. Uh, it's extended from the South China Sea northeastward into uh, the Taiwan. So, and then uh, for the northward trade type, we can see, uh, we also can see anomaly of the moisture convergence over here. So, from this result, we can conclude that moisture convergence anomaly within the 30 to 60 day cyclonic anomaly provide favorable conditions for tissue formation and then later on and, uh, and later tissue movement. So based on this study, we have uh, uh, some uh, uh, point to uh, summarize. So tracks of the South China Sea form, the TC, exhibit clear seasonal variability. Different uh, TC track are associated with a different combination of the variability in the steering flow, monsoon trough, and the Western Pacific subtropic high. And then the uh, spatial, spatial distribution of the 30 to 60 day ISO anomalies provide a favorable conditions of moisture convergence by which tissue movement is affected. That's all my talk. Uh, any question? Uh, thank you, Professor Chen Zhaoming. Uh, please move forward to the question uh, area. Uh, so, Professor Chen, um, yes, how do yes. we relate uh, this? Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, how how do we relate this to kind of the regional sea surface temperature condition over the South China Sea areas? So we, we see that there is a large um, interannual variabilities in in the sea surface uh, temperature conditions, and um, what you uh, mentioned here, uh, can, can you, maybe we can uh, also link the, the interannual part to to the variabilities you show here. Uh, uh, on that? I think uh, the variability of the sea surface temperature uh, mainly uh, can change or modulate the formation number of TC over the South China Sea because uh, you are due to the mass one phase, I think, uh, around the around the early summer, okay, and then the uh, you uh, can uh, the SS the SST uh, major the warming center of the SST uh, move uh, south eastward into a uh, uh, tropical warm pool, so uh, that's the meaning uh, during the uh, during the fall. So the TC formations based upon based upon these uh, SST variations. Uh, TC formation tend to occur in the northern South China Sea during summer, and then in the southern China, so, southern, so, in the southern South China Sea during the uh, fall. So I think SAT, uh, SAT variability is very important for TC formation, and then uh, of course for interannual variability, that, that's another important issue. But but uh, to some extent, uh, the interannual variability of SAT over the South China Sea is uh, highly related to uh, answer variability. So in many uh, studies, uh, we will combine the impact of the answer and the SA variability over the South China Sea to, uh, together uh, to present their joint effect on the, on the SAT, uh, on the TC variability over the South China Sea. Thank you. Anyone else? So yesterday, Professor Lin Yi mentioned that the translational speed of TC over South China Sea is speeding up. Uh, maybe some of you remember. That. So, so I remember she mentioned the uh, South China Sea typhoon is moving faster and faster. So maybe some of the steering flow you analyze here can be related to her uh, analysis. Yeah. I, I, 
No, not possible, but uh, I didn't look at this aspect. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we need to move on. Okay. So uh, our third talk uh, in this session uh, is by Professor Lu Mengming from National Taiwan University. So she will talk about the MJO and uh, convectively coupled equatorial waves influence um, uh, the rainfall over Philippines and the evaluation in the S2S database, okay? So, yes, we can see your slides now. You can see my slides. Okay, yes. yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, good part. thank you. Thank you, yeah, good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, yeah, sorry for the very long title of my talk and uh, this work is a uh, uh, part of this work is the uh, um is from the math master thesis of uh, Wen Chai uh Cai Yuan Huai and uh, Cai Yuan Huai is the uh, is jointly supervised by me and uh, Professor Sui and uh, he graduated one year ago yeah and he has a poster to discuss the uh, Queensland flood event in 2019. So welcome everyone to view his poster in the afternoon. Okay, so, so this study was motivated by, by the event, a very special event that's uh, during uh, December 2017, and which is one of the LP of the system mix. And uh, we saw three tropical cyclones passed through the Philippines into the South China Sea successively in three weeks. Uh, before this, I, 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 was not, uh, I did not pay so much attention to this area, but after uh, with the, the uh, system mix, and uh, I started to look into this area. So I'm curious about that, whether uh, this is successive, successive uh, TC, uh, intrusion is uh, one of the major reasons to cause the severe floods here because, uh, uh, for, for example, in this event, it caused the severe floods, the next slides, and the sea transportation interruption and the, health, and the high death toll and the, in Mindanao. Okay, so the objective of this study is uh, to identify the influential large-scale factors on the boreal winter rainfall extremes over the eastern Philippines. And the why eastern Philippines, I will explain it later. And the, the second objective is to propose useful extended range model forecast evaluation concept and uh, practice that can be applied to weather and the climate services. I think for the weather and the climate services, they really lead some kind of uh, evaluation tools that uh, they can easily understand and that they can be applied to their um, operational work. And after the, this study, we found that, uh, uh, so, so how can I move this? Sorry, I cannot find the micro, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So after this study, and we found that uh, we still need more S2S uh, data that have more than one forecast runs within a week. I will show you later that uh, actually, actually we do not have enough data to for analyzing such such kind of um, sub-seasonal scale extreme event. So the, there are four scientific questions. The first one is: Is it uh, unusual to observe uh, success? successive TC strike on the Philippines during December and, and December to January, that's a boreal winter, within a narrow time window of two weeks or three weeks. And uh, are the subseasonal peak rainfall events after uh, often associated with uh, tropical cyclones? And what is the relationship between successive TC strike and the rainfall? And the third question is, what large-scale factors are influential to the subseasonal peak rainfall event? And finally, we want to know how well can S2S prediction models capture the large-scale factors and the sub-monthly rainfall variability? 
and, and the data we use the, is uh, uh, the, there are uh, some standard data, and for the atmosphere variables, is we use the EIA five uh, realized data, and the precipitation we use CMOF. And why do we use a CMOV? Because a CMOV is very easy to use, but uh, the the sh shortcoming is that they they have data only available from uh, 1998. So because we want to use the CMOV precipitation data as a uh, uh, observation uh, to re represent the ob observational truth. So our analysis were based on uh, all the data start from the 1998. And we also used the outgoing long radiation and the SST and the TC data, we used the uh, GMA analyzed the data. And also for the uh, forecast evaluation, we follow the, the standard procedure uh, that's uh, um, uh, the, uh, that's uh, available at the website of the uh, BOM. And then for the S2S uh, high cast uh, uh, and the forecast data, uh, in this study, we analyzed the four models. I will explain why we only analyzed these four models. That's the ECMWF, NCF, BOM, and the CMA models. Okay, so the first question is, is it unusual to observe successive TC strike on the Philippines? during uh, boreal winter within a narrow time window of two weeks. And uh, this is a summary table that shows the uh, maxima TC count observed within three weeks, uh, three week uh, window over the Philippines uh, for, for 20 years, uh, starting from 1998. And uh, the result shows that there are 30% of the years uh, did not see any tropical cyclones. And the 40% of the years uh, saw at least one, uh, saw one tropical cyclone so within uh, three weeks. And 25% uh, uh, of the years, they saw uh, more than two tropical cyclones. And uh, so, so it is normal to see the TC strike on the Philippines during uh, Winter, but successively three within three weeks only occurred twice in twenty years. Uh, these two cases, one occurred one occurred during the uh, two, uh, 17, 18 winter, and then the other occurred during the uh, two thousand six uh, uh, and the uh, and the seven winter. That's a uh, an Nino winter, and then the two thousand seventeen eighteen is a uh, La Nina winter. And the difference between these two um, frequent uh, tropical cyclone winters is that uh, in during the 2017 case, the rainfall amount is much large, much larger than the 2006 uh, case, and uh, we think that uh, this may be because of the maturation of the La Nina. Okay, so. The second question is, are the subseasonal peak rainfall events often associated with the TCs? And what is the relationship between successive TC strike and the rainfall? And then the, the target event of this study is so-called a subseasonal peak rainfall event, SPRE. And the definition is very simple. It's the event with maximum accumulated rainfall amount in successive three pentas, that's 15 days, on the basis of a range of three months. So we detect this SPRE by uh, using a, run, a moving uh, three months window and then so that we can detect, we can detect the SPRE uh, in a continuous way to, to find out now, uh, what's the maxima uh, subseasonal peak rainfall event within the 90 days? And uh, for the case we, we analyzed in this study, and uh, the, the, the box, uh, it shows that uh, this is the SPRE. But the SPRE, the extreme event, is uh, regional dependent. So we need to define now what region we want to study. For this, for, for the 2017 case, you can see that the maximum rainfall occurred uh, over the eastern Philippines. 
and and uh, centered around the ten north. So we pick we pick up this nine north to fourteen north and uh, one uh, one hundred twenty two east to one hundred twenty seven east. The this box as our uh, target uh, ta target area. And then if we will compare the GPM, uh, I'm uh, I'm precipitation and the CMOV precipitation, you can see that these two data is very similar, although they show some. Um, Although the, the GPM shows a much higher uh, resolved uh, uh, precipitation uh, observation. But for the eastern uh, Philippines, we see that the CMOF actually uh, really captured this maxima event. Okay, so, so this is, uh, next is that uh, we try to identify for all the SPREs uh, and do, over the uh, 23 years, uh, what's the relationship between ENSO and uh, uh, TC and uh, MGO and uh, the convective coupled equatorial waves, CCEWs? And for the tropical waves or equatorial waves, we, we analyze the ER and the MRG. And then in this table, you can see, see that if the years marked in blue, that's the Nanina year, and the, the years marked in red, that's the Nino year. And uh, uh, so, so first of all, if we see the NTC, um, the NTC column, uh, sorry, I cannot find that because it's very co not convenient. The NTC column that shows that uh, uh, after 2011, it seems that uh, TC occurred more frequent compared with the years before 2011. And then, but the 2017 case still shows that uh, there are two uh, TC uh, attacked, so that's a, a kind of a maxima. And also, if you see the last column, that's the ER, or MRG uh, column, you can, if we mark a Y, that means yes, uh, when the SPRE occurred, we, uh, the, we detect the ER and, or MRG concurrently occur, uh, occur, occurred. So uh, you can see that uh, there are, uh, the most frequent occur, uh, occurrence uh, 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 of the uh, equatorial waves, that's the ER. So uh, during the 20s, three cases, we found that, uh, that 83% of ER are associated with this uh, SP, or, or actually it's SPRE are associated with the ER with that 83% of the SPRE associated with the ER waves. But for the MGO, there are 52% of SPRE is associated with this MGO. And, uh, uh, with both ER and uh, M MGO, it's uh, uh, 39%. So we can see that uh, for this Eastern Philippine uh, SPRE, it seems that the ER is the most influential factor among the uh, ENSO and the MGO and the CCEWs. And, uh, but uh, among the top Five maximum rainfall SPRE is that uh, is marked in the red uh, rectangular box. The 2017 is the only one with two TZ strikes. On the other hand, it is that not all the uh, maximum rainfall SPRE is that associated with the TCs. So, and that, for example, the 2010 uh, the case uh, actually this is 2010 the 11 uh, winter. And there's, there's a very uh, large rainfall, but there's no TC associated with this uh, event. And uh, uh, we found that uh, the, the, because the 2017-18 uh, is a Nanina winter, and actually among five years with the largest SPRE rainfall amount, there are three, uh, three are Nanina years. Uh, so it, it, they are marked in, in blue color, and the one is the Enino year. So it suggests that the Namina uh, set a favorable background condition for the record breaking event. The record break, breaking event, I, I meant the 2017 event. 
The how, however, the timing of when the SBRE can uh, occur depends on other factors. Oh, sorry, uh, so I need to speed up. Okay. So when we check the last scale inferential uh, phenomena, first of all, first of all, we check the MGLO, and we found that when the SPI occurred, uh, most of the SPI occurred uh, during the phases five to eight uh, MGLO. Uh, phases. So that means the con MGO conversion is, is active to the east of the 130 degree east. And then, so I will skip this part uh, where we use the standard procedure to identify the equatorial wave, waves and then use the filtered uh, techniques to filter out the, the waves. And uh, for this 2017 event, uh, it occurred during a very active uh, MGO period. And this MGO, uh, active MGO period, you can look at the right uh, uh, whole formula diagram. Oh, my cursor appeared. So this active MGO uh, phase is excited the, the ER at the, off the equator ER. And also the ER is associated with the active MRG and the MRG and the ER, they are associated with the tropical cyclone. So this is a very interest, interesting case to study. Okay, so last part is how well can S2 as a prediction model capture the inferential large scale uh, factors. Uh, I mentioned that we only analyze these four models because we, uh, because they, they, their initialization uh, frequency is not every day, only CMA and the NSEP, they initial in, in, in they have the initialization every day but the other they have twice forecast per week and that all the other unselected model they have a less frequent uh, uh, forecast runs compared with these four models and uh, uh, in, in short that we use a two for strategy to end up to study and evaluate the model forecast and we evaluate the SPRE forecast that's based on their PR rank and their ratio compared to their seasonal uh, totals. And uh, uh, this is the result. Basically, the two, 2017 forecast is much better compared to the uh, hindcast. The shaded part is the hindcast. And here, the dotted part is the uh, forecast, the, the 2017, and the boxes that they are for the hindcast. So this is the root mean square errors. So you can see that the 2017 cases for most of time now in the bottom compared to the high case results. And also the other variation is we evaluated the MGO and the, and the equatorial convective waves based on the multiple category uh, forecast uh, strategy uh, or, or evaluation method. And uh, so, so uh, we we for the forecast variation we just uh, check the whole Muller diagram of all the uh, prediction lead time and uh, okay and, uh, and they use the HK score to measure the MGO and the ER forecast uh, again this is forecast for 2017 case is the better than the other years. Okay, so this is my conclusion. So uh, it is normal to see TC strikes on the Philippines during DJF, but the successive three within uh, 15 days only occurred twice in 20 years. And uh, the 15-day uh, accumulated rainfall uh, record-breaking SPRE in December 2017 over the central Philippines are influenced by multi multiple scale weather and the climate systems. And we think La Nina provides a seasonal background condition for more rain, rain but uh, M MGO and uh, the associated ER waves set the occurrence time of the SPRE and the TCs. So, so the EM ECMWF shows the best uh, forecast and uh, also NCEP is very good. And the both model shows the uh, 2017 case is better than their high cast expectation. And then we hope that the S2S project can provide more frequent uh, focus data for us to study these kind of subseasonal extreme red, uh, events. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Lu. So, any quick questions for uh, Professor Lu?
So uh, I think it's uh, nice that we can kind of uh, separate these uh, extreme rainfalls uh, uh, to kind of attribute them to different uh, climate probabilities. Uh, so uh, I, I think overall we aim towards the S2S uh, uh, predictions for the regional extreme rainfalls, but uh, I, I think the model is still kind of diverse in their results. So do we kind of see the, the diversity of the model as a, uh, a way to give us some ensemble or some probability distribution, or do you think we need to uh, understand uh, the skills of different models and then and then choose the kind of the better ones? Do you, for, for yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is a tough question. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, I like to choose the. I, I yeah. First of all, we see the big diversity between the models. Yeah, like uh, oh, we only analyze four, but uh, these four models they show big uh, the, their results are di diverse, and also we analyze the the Australia event, and then we show that we we saw that the four model performance actually. Uh, not the same over the Philippines and uh, over the, the southern, southern hemisphere, Australia region. So we think that uh, it's really difficult to say which model is the best unless you are sure about what you want to forecast, mm -hmm. uh, it's particularly for the extreme event. So this is uh, you know, what we have learned from this study. And also like uh, uh, ECMWF, it's just uh, better than any other model, even compared with the NCEP, it's more stable and it provides more members. So I would, I would recommend, the, for example, like a CWB, they, they, they really uh, need to, if, if, if they are short of resources, in particular manpower, they should concentrate on the ECMWF uh, forecast the first, because I think the, Maybe they can use the NCEP as a comparison and, the, and the to not only rely on one single, single model to make their decision. Yeah, but, they, but anyway, I think another thing is that we found that uh, the high cast data, actually the model, the, the S2S database for the high cast data, the member number and the forecast frequency are different from the forecast. And uh, we also don't think this is. Uh, well, this is good. We hope that uh -huh. that's better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and can provide more, more data. <laughs> okay. uh, Professor Sui, you have questions? Yeah, okay. I think I have a quick comment. Yes. Uh, the MTO uh, moment referred to in this particular December uh, is actually a kind of a stationary uh, MTO intra-seasonal signal. And uh, so it tends to be, I think, uh, uh, kind of confined within the Western Pacific for maybe 15 days during the La Nina condition. And so this may be uh, the reason the model seems uh, doing better than the overall hand cast. And uh, our experience with the real-time monitoring of the two-week forecast, it appears that when the intrasignal signal is particularly strong, is then many of the models can capture it. <laughs> but if the, the intracellular oscillation is kind of transient and unclear or something we call immature, immature, then the model normally, no matter what, we have problems. Mm -hmm. only, you can only look at the first week. The second week normally cannot, it's not very useful. But anyway, we still have a long way to go. Thank yes. You. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, but even for MGO, we found that, uh, uh, for example, like a BOM model, they can predict very well for the equatorial MGO, but not the e MGO inference of the equator. We are very curious about it because they, the BOM model uh, forecast is very, is relatively good, you know, for the Australia uh, extreme event, but in, did did poorly for the Philippine event. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? 
Uh, if not, uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Lu and also thank all the keynote lecturers and uh, uh, talk, uh, three talks uh, for these morning sessions. And thank, thanks all the audience for participating in uh, this YMC uh, South China Sea uh, session. Uh, I hope you enjoy the uh, presentation and the discussion as well. So uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, one and a half hour from now, we will have the poster sessions. So please come back after your lunch. And we have a very nicely uh, set up poster hall, and I will uh, show you how to uh, view or present the poster uh, at 1.30 Taipei time uh, in the afternoon. So thank you, and see you later. Okay, please enjoy your lunch. Uh, Minghui, do you have any something else to say? If not, then bye-bye, see you around. Thank you. Thank you.